If you've been watching our videos for a little while, you might recognize this vehicle behind me. This is our M3A1 Stuart light tank that we restored last year. It was a really fun restoration project, but because we're working on our Sherman Jumbo, we're actually looking to sell it. Now you might be wondering, how much does a vehicle like this set you back? Well, if you give me a few moments of your time, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the vehicle. We're gonna hop inside and have a real deep look inside of it. And then I'm gonna let you know how much this vehicle is on the market for. If you didn't know already, my name's Alex Garnett and welcome to the Armageddon channel. So the M3 Stuart. Now this was originally created by the Americans in 1940, but it didn't actually see service until 1941 where it was used in the North African campaigns. They needed something a little bit better than the M2 light tank, which was becoming obsolete. And for the first couple of years of the war, this this M3 Stuart was actually a very good vehicle. Obviously it did come later on, they did upgrade it to an M5, but for the time period, especially in the desert, this wasn't too bad at all. Being an American-made vehicle, the Stuart got used by pretty much every Allied military during World War II. It was used by the Americans, obviously, it was used by the British, the Australians, even the Soviet Union. The one behind me actually got used by the Brazilians when it was being used in North Italy. Supposedly, at the time, the crews of these vehicles absolutely loved them. They found them very reliable. This had a seven-cylinder radial engine, which supposedly was a lot more reliable than the nine-cylinder that was in the Shermans. It was, with also its speed and maneuverability, the crews absolutely loved them. Although I'm sure it's one of the more reliable vehicles, I'm going to show you inside now because I can imagine it was definitely not one of the comfiest. Originally it would have had four men in here, so just remember that when I show you inside. So there is only a couple ways to actually get into this vehicle. Here you can see you've got the driver's seat, that's one way you'd get in. And then at the very top you have got a couple of hatches up there. Now those hatches I can imagine were definitely the easier one but I'm gonna try and get into the driver's area just here and show you what that would have looked like. Now you have got the co-driver who's sitting just next to him and I presume he would have to get in through the top turret, crawl down through the turret basket and slide in. Because although I guess he could have probably have fitted through there, you'd definitely have to be quite a thin bloke. But I'm gonna give it a go now and uh, see if I can get in. Now thankfully it does have a couple handles. Oh, it looks like the turret lock's not on. Uh, this is the fun bit, how on earth? Do you actually get in? Oh, you sort of have to slide yourself in and then twist around once you're inside. Oh, I'm sure there's much, much better ways to get in, but there you go. <laughs> it's a bit of a tight fit, I must admit. And here we are now sat in the driver's area. As you can see, you've got everything you're gonna need down there, the accelerator, the clutch, the starter, all the dials that you're gonna need. And it's a very tight fit in here, but here you can see you've got your tillers to steer as well. Now, you can probably see just there, that is your, uh, telling you which gears they are, but the gear selector is actually just there, <laughs> which is pretty much right under your armpit. Obviously, you'd be driving usually like this, but it doesn't make it that easy. Then you've got the co-driver who would be sitting here, and that's the uh, 30 cal machine gun that you would be using. But you can just see there is absolutely no room, especially when you've got the basket just here. Now you can imagine if that basket was spinning around and this bar was somewhere here, he would have absolutely no chance of getting out. I will get up there in a second, but here you can see in the turret. And this one is a very, well, we've restored it pretty much as much as we can on the inside. So it's got pretty much everything that you can think of that it would need. And the issue with that is, it means there is absolutely no room, especially when you've got that 37 millimeter just there. I mean, that just takes up what, about a third of this whole compartment. And now for the fun bit, trying to get out, which I can imagine is gonna be a little bit easier than getting in, apart from your feet to get caught on every little thing in there, especially wearing big boots does not help. But there you go. Ugh. A little bit easier. Oh. Now we're gonna hop up and I'll show you guys inside of the turret basket, hopefully a little bit clearer. Thankfully, it's a lot easier to climb up on top of this one. As you can see, we're now on top and here are the two hatches. So we'll open this one up, straight into there and we'll open this one up, get a little bit more light in there. Cause as you can see, it's, uh, it's quite dark. But there we are. Now I know it's probably a little bit hard to kind of visualize how small it is, especially these hatches, but that is a size 10 boot and it nearly fills up the hatch. So I'm gonna to attempt to get in and I'll show you guys what it looks like inside when I'm there. So just here is where the commander would have sat. As you can see, he's got all the radio equipment down there and that's where the uh, maps are meant to be. 
but just down here is where the co-driver would have sat. Obviously, he's got his 30 cal machine gun down there, but if there's an emergency, I mean, there is absolutely no chance that he's getting out in any quick time. Obviously, you've got to wait for the commander to get out, and then you've got to hopefully follow out. And you can imagine, if you've just been shot at, you're only going to have a couple seconds. I mean, look at that, just where those gauges are, he's going to struggle to try and get past there and get out the driver's position. I mean, I must say, the bloke with the worst job was probably that guy just there. As with most tanks in World War II, here you've got the uh, the hydraulics so you can spin around and, well, go a lot faster than you can by hand. And just down here, you've got the elevation. So that obviously brings the gun down and brings the gun up. But I must say, like, just where your arm is, there is no room. I know I keep going around it, but Jesus, this thing is so tight. I know it was one of the smaller tanks, but crikey, I would not have liked to have been in it. And of course, if you need to, you do always have your manual traverse. And you can see, it is quite fast. Again, such an awkward position, really. If you think you're trying to have to do everything at once, you've got your elevation there and your manual traverse here. So I'm going to try and hop on out now. There we go. And of course, Close the hatches up, it's one and two. Now this Stuart does actually have three 30 cal machine guns on it. You've got one on the very top, you've got obviously one in the turret and then one for the co-driver. However, quite often that one on the very top, they would swap out for a 50 cal machine gun. It obviously has a 37 millimeter cannon on top. As you can imagine, at the beginning of the war, this, it did all right, it was worth it. However, later on, as the time went on, you needed something a lot bigger than this 37 millimeter. One notable variant was the M3A3. Now this was used by the Marine Corps in the Pacific and it was actually made with a flamethrower on it. After the war, the Stuart did keep getting used. For example, it did see service in the Korean War and the Vietnam War. She does have a top speed of up to about 36 miles per hour and an operational range of up to about 100 miles as well. All thanks to the engine, which I'm going to show you now. So just inside this engine bay, which I'm going to open for you in a second, is the seven cylinder radial. However, quick note to make, quite often in these, they would actually have the Cadillac V8 engines, I believe. Now you might notice we haven't actually put bolts in every single one. Reason for this is because if there is ever an emergency and we need to get in there, it's much easier just to undo this one if there's ever a fire. But here she is in all of her glory. Now you might be able to notice there is a little bit of oil and stuff because I believe she did have a bit of a loose pipe after a few weeks of her running. So obviously we had to take the engine out and fix that, but now she runs absolutely lovely. One of the most notable features on the M3 Stuart was its suspension system. The tank used a modified Christie suspension, which allowed for a smoother ride over much rougher terrain. The suspension system also allowed the tank to sort of bounce over obstacles, which made it much harder to hit with anti-tank weapons. As I said earlier, the M3 Stuart was used in many parts of the world during World War II. It included North Africa, Europe, and the Pacific. It was primarily used for reconnaissance and light tank duties, although it was occasionally used in combat against heavier tanks. The tank's speed and maneuverability made it well situated for hit and run tactics. It was often used to harass enemy units and disrupt supply lines. The tank was also used for scouting and intelligence gathering. This is mainly because of its quiet engine and its small size. However, the M3 Stuart was definitely not without its flaws. Take for example the armour. Now this was designed as a light reconnaissance tank. Because of this, it had to sacrifice something to get that speed and maneuverability, which obviously they sacrificed the armour. Now it's not to say the armour was horrendous. For example, on the very front, I believe it was about 45 and on top it was about 38 millimeter don't get me wrong nothing special nothing crazy but it's not the end of the world if you end up against another tank head on however it's the side on the side they would only have about 28 millimeters of armor on both sides which is absolutely horrendous of course the sides and the back are the least likely parts to be hit on the vehicle so of course if you are going to have to trade some armor for that speed and maneuverability they are the obvious choice in addition to its military service the Stuart has played a huge role in popular culture for example it's ended up being on a lot of video games, for example, Call of Duty, also War Thunder, World of Tanks. One interesting thing about our Stuart, it was actually imported into this country by a UK buyer who also bought 13 others. So in total, 14 Stuarts got bought into the country. Now we did end up buying it quite a few years later and obviously it needed a full restoration process, which if you haven't already, we have made a load of other videos for you to go see, the whole restoration process. One thing I think we've
interesting is the actual colour scheme. Quite often you always see these as always painted fully green, whereas we've gone for a half desert, half green camouflage, which is relatively interesting, kind of breaks it up from all the other green stuff that we've got in the museum. Now, as I mentioned at the very beginning, I am going to tell you how much we're selling this Stuart for, but before I do so, why are we selling it? Now, we don't usually like to sell stuff in the Armageddon collection, but the reason we're doing so, if you haven't seen already, we're making a Sherman Jumbo, we're restoring it. So the funds from this are hopefully going to go towards supporting that but the asking price for this is currently £180,000 so if you're interested by all means send us an email but anyway hope you have enjoyed the video my name's Alex Garner and if you have please do like and subscribe and I'll see you in the next video